Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, very happy to talk about some of the ideas uh, I've been working on uh, uh, regarding sparse reconstruction uh, in radar and remote sensing. Uh, so before I uh, start my talk, uh, uh, here is a brief uh, introduction about uh, uh, IEEE Aerospace and Electronic Systems Society uh, under the auspices of which uh, today's lecture is held. Uh, so AESS, uh, is, uh, it focuses on uh, systems engineering, design, development, integration uh, of uh, complex systems for uh, space, air, ocean, and ground-based applications. Uh, so obviously radar is a big part of that, but also navigation, uh, satellite, avionics, uh, uh, sonar, telemetry, military, um, and, and various other topics that are listed here. So it's, it's, uh, it covers very broad uh, aspects of aerospace and electronic systems. And uh, 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 here, is, uh, uh, here are some more details about AESS. So it actually sponsors uh, or co-sponsors about uh, 30 conferences uh, within IEEE, uh, uh, which are aimed at dissemination of research as well as allowing networking and uh, uh, building up our community. Um, uh, in uh, terms of member services, uh, we have about more than 5,000 members and more than 100 chapters worldwide. And there are various programs uh, like the mentoring program, uh, and then also to help students and young professionals uh, to increase the engagement and membership. Uh, in technical panels, uh, there are about six technical panels uh, which focus on supporting IEEE conferences as well as creation of standards and uh, again, uh, uh, finding out topics which could be of interest uh, to AESS and then how to promote research uh, and engineering you know, on those topics. Uh, there are several publications that uh, AESS uh, uh, sponsors or uh, uh, directly uh, responsible for. For example, IEEE Systems Magazine is one of them, uh, Transactions on Aerospace and Electronic Systems, uh, or TAES, and very recently, Transactions on Radar Systems, or TRS, has also been started uh, via uh, AESS. And there are also newsletters. Uh, in terms of education, uh, 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 there is obviously this distinguished lecture program, but there are also short courses uh, 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 that are available virtually or uh, yeah, even in person in certain cases. There are also a lot of tutorials that uh, uh, various uh, AESS conferences they offer uh, to, uh, to the members. Uh, and AESS uh, 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 awards, but there are about 17 awards uh, 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 that uh, AESS annually awards to uh, distinguished members of our community. So uh, for the DL program, they are both in person as well as online, and you can check the online schedule on AESS webpage, uh, what they call as Virtual Distinguished Lecturer Program. Uh, there are more than 100 uh, uh, top titles uh, across a variety of uh, technical fields, and uh, the lecturers also, they, uh, they are drawn internationally uh, and with different affiliations, academia, industry, as well as uh, um, uh, government labs. Uh, and education, as I mentioned, uh, uh, you can uh, log in, uh, log online, and then um, uh, all these short courses, they are open to all members. Uh, and as I said, they, they are run virtually, but then you can also uh, ask for uh, uh, exclusive uh, short courses uh, for your organization. Uh, so check out our, our online library where there are about more than 125 uh, recordings uh, uh, on IEEE Learning Network. So uh, uh, in the IEEE Learning Network, uh, uh, sometimes uh, some of the courses are paid and uh, uh, sometimes so many of them are actually free as well. And as I mentioned, there are several conferences that AESS uh, financially and technically sponsors. Uh, the leading conference, uh, at least in the radar uh, community, is the IEEE Radar Conference, uh, which will be held in San Antonio, Texas, uh, about uh, one and a half months later in May. Uh, uh, there will be several tutorials, technical sessions uh, uh, in radar conference. Um, uh, there is also aerospace conference that will be uh, held in Montana. Uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's already, uh, it has happened in 2023. Uh, there's auto test con for the uh, automation uh, uh, community. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, in AESS, there is radar is a big component, but the navigation, avionics, 
uh, EW or electronic warfare, as well as the automation uh, industry is also uh, included there. So AutotestCon is the conference, and this will be held in Maryland uh, here, uh, where I am uh, in uh, near Washington, DC. Uh, and then we have this digital avionics systems uh, conference that will be held in uh, uh, Barcelona for the avionics community. So these are some of the upcoming conferences. There are uh, uh, obviously there are several other conferences that AESS is involved in. So I encourage you to actually uh, go to the website uh, and uh, look into what are other conferences that may be of interest to you. For example, there is a fusion conference which will be held in Charleston uh, in South Carolina. Uh, so we also have a big fusion community within AESS as well. And uh, January 2023 is the 50th anniversary uh, of uh, AESS. Uh, there are several events uh, that are being uh, organized and uh, we are also encouraging our members to celebrate uh, uh, the 50th anniversary in their own events. So there was uh, uh, the society uh, level uh, event in Princeton, uh, I think a few weeks ago, uh, but then there, there are going to be several other events throughout the year. And here's a list of uh, uh, officers uh, of AESS. Uh, so uh, President uh, Mark Davis and then the incoming president is Maria Sabrina Greco. And for various other uh, 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 requirements or uh, domains, you can reach out to uh, these officers. Uh, so for uh, distinguished lecturers, uh, the VP education, uh, Alex Charles is uh, uh, responsible for the uh, DL program. Uh, is, is there a question? Okay. So, so that brings me to uh, uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about, which is about uh, sparse reconstruction in Copelsing and Coast Effect DLA. Uh, so there are multiple elements of this uh, title, and we'll look into each one of them uh, sequentially uh, before finding out uh, how Coast FFT works. Um, one second. Let me. Uh, the the audio in our room is kind of soft. Let me see if I can switch to a different speaker. That will may help. Let's see, for me. Let me see if uh, this will help. Um, can you say something? Hello? Okay, it's not working. Uh, how about now? Can you say something? Hello? Nope, I don't hear you. Oh, I guess. <laughs> try, try again. Hello? Yeah, so looks like the only one that works is the... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't seem to allow you to switch. Yeah, it turns off the volume too much. There's distortion. Oh, I see. Oh, that's why you turn it down? Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Do you have it back? Well? Yeah, I think okay. so. I think I switch it back to the echo. So you should be able to hear me hear him now. Yeah. Yeah. Echo feels it. yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I think we just have to uh, come closer to the uh, speaker. So we can pull that aside. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, there was distortion. Oh, I see. Half the value of the volume too much. Okay, you're good. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, uh, yes, we'll focus on each one of these keywords that you see in the title uh, before, uh, uh, in the end, we uh, try to see what Coast FFT is all about. Um, so uh, in the ASS format, I have to put the biography, but I think uh, uh, Mohamed has already spoken about it, so I'll skip it. I'll just uh, provide some highlights in this slide. So I'm a senior fellow at uh, Army Research Lab in Adelphi near Washington, DC. Uh, I'm actually in Maryland. Uh, and then um, uh, I also have a, a research appointment in the University of Luxembourg, and I'm a, a technical advisor of uh, these two very promising startups. Uh, one is the Boston-based uh, uh, imaging uh, 5G radar st uh, startup Aura Intelligence Systems, and then uh, Hertzwell in Singapore, which is Asia's first automotive radar startup. 
Uh, and then there are a lot of activities I do in um, International Union of Radio Science. So I'm vice chair for Commission C, which deals with radio communications and signal processing. And uh, uh, a lot of radar and signal processing aspects are dealt with in that commission. Uh, and within AESS, I'm um, uh, associate editor of Transactions of on Aerospace and Electronic Systems. And then I engage with various other societies as well, um, as mentioned in my bio. Uh, in AESS, I'm also part of radar systems panel where um, uh, I also look into the standards aspect of that. So synthetic uh, aperture standards committee of IEEE uh, has been working on drafting synthetic uh, aperture standards, not across just synthetic aperture radar, but many other synthetic aperture applications, for example, in optics, sonar, communications, uh, and so on. So there is some overlap of those activities with uh, what I do in radar systems panel in AESS. So my research interest is primarily radar, and I study its connections with signal processing, electromagnetics, communications, and remote sensing. Uh, and in this context, um, a large part of my work is also about joint radar communications or integrated sensing and communications. Uh, and I have this uh, 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 upcoming book that uh, I'm plugging in here uh, uh, to be published by Wiley IEEE Press, which is about how we can design systems which can be multifunctional, can do both radar communications and uh, other applications. So this is the talk title, and we'll uh, uh, the uh, and and the abstract, and then we'll we'll see uh, 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 the details uh, in a bit. So I'll start with the motivation challenges. Why do we need this sparse reconstruction? What kind of advantages it offers? And then uh, we'll uh, uh, look into the background of reduced rate radars. Uh, how how we can reduce number of samples in spatial, temporal, and Doppler domain. And then uh, uh, we'll look into uh, this specific uh, uh, aspect of that, which is co-pulsing FDA radar, and then how to uh, do clutter separation uh, via CO-STAT. And then later on, I'll focus on some of the extensions of these concepts uh, in various other applications. So the motivation for uh, this work comes from the fact that uh, uh, in mo modern radar systems, uh, if we want high range resolution, then typically the transmit signal bandwidth has to be very large, which could be hundreds of megahertz and uh, ultra wideband radars could even go to gigahertz. And when uh, uh, such a signal is transmitted and then it comes back from the tar target and then uh, we have to sample it at Nyquist rate, uh, which as we know is directly related to the signal bandwidth. So if the bandwidth is large, the sampling rates are also large, and then you get a lot of samples, and then you have to process it uh, uh, in conventional radars. For example, mass filter processing would uh, have to process a lot of these samples. So there are lo uh, large computational and hardware costs. You have to use high rate ADCs uh, in order to maintain this high res range resolution. And then uh, a similar concept arises in the angular domain. So if we want high angular resolution, we have to use uh, an antenna array with several antenna elements. So that is the spatial version of Nyquist uh, Shannon sampling theorem. Uh, and then uh, if, uh, if we want to do the estimation of the direction of arrival or the angular location, uh, then the equivalent of the match filter processing will be the conventional Fourier beam forming here. And again, it, uh, it will, uh, there'll, there'll be costs involved, there are computational costs if, if there are several array elements. So, uh, uh, and uh, if you want this high angular resolution, then uh, the number of elements, they scale linearly with the array aperture and resolution. So it's usually you need several uh, uh, such antennas. So there has always been interest, can we reduce the sampling rate? Can we reduce the number of array elements? And then uh, a third aspect uh, of this would be in Doppler domain. So if you want to estimate uh, uh, the Doppler velocity with high Doppler resolution, then you need to transmit a lot of pulses as well. So can we reduce those pulses uh, too? So uh, uh, there has been interest in this area. How can we do that? And uh, uh, then back in 2006 and seven, uh, uh, theory of compressed sensing was proposed. And what this says is that uh, if uh, 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 there is a signal of interest, which is sparse, so for example, this vector X that we want to measure, it is sparse, that means only a few of its entries are non-zero and everything else is zero. And in the case of uh, 
in the presence of noise, uh, everything else is noise and there are just few entries which are uh, uh, actually signal of interest. So if it is, uh, if we have a signal like this, then it is possible to sample it below the Nyquist rate. And then still you can recover the information from uh, uh, the measured signal Y, which is of much smaller dimension than X, uh, as long as uh, you uh, take measurements in a particular way. So for example, uh, uh, we have this measurement matrix A. So measurement is characterized by this matrix A. It is uh, sampling uh, fewer uh, uh, elements from X and then you get Y. So if it was a Nyquist case, then we will have a square matrix. But since this is a uh, sub Nyquist or below Nyquist case, uh, the matrix is actually what we call as a rectangular or a fat matrix A. So with this rectangular matrix A, uh, uh, if, if we do some kind of random sampling or um, um, uh, yeah, there are some other special ways uh, to sample X, because if you sample it uniformly, most likely you'll end up with zeros because it is a sparse vector. So you have to do uh, this random measurement of X. So if we could do that uh, and X is sparse, then using compressed sensing algorithms, and there, there is a, a, a whole literature on it, uh, what kind of algorithms could be used, you can recover X from Y. So even though if we look at this equation, Y is equal to AX, uh, then uh, linear algebra tells us that uh, you cannot get X from Y because you have fewer equations and more variables to solve for. Uh, but only under these conditions that I just mentioned that X is sparse and A has this special structure, then you can get X from Y. So that's what compressed sensing is about. So when this was proposed, uh, several applications came out. Uh, okay, what all we could do with compressed sensing, people applied in communications, imaging, uh, uh, and uh, many, many other uh, uh, different domains. And in radar, uh, obviously the interest was because of these considerations that I mentioned here, that can we use uh, this sparse reconstruction methods uh, to reduce the temporal, spatial, and Doppler sampling rates in radars. Uh, and there uh, has been have been a lot of works on that, and uh, we have been looking into uh, uh, several other applications of sparse reconstruction in radar that I'll uh, uh, mention in a bit. So uh, let's look into uh, uh, some of the background uh, uh, background principles on how we could reduce these uh, sampling rates in these three domains, and then we'll come to the co-pulsing uh, concept. So we'll start with first the temporarily reduced rate radar, the uh, simpler concept. So here's the signal model that we use. Uh, we are uh, looking into pulse Doppler uh, radar. So uh, the transmit signal is a, a pulse train um, uh, where we are transmitting P pulses. And let's consider that there are L targets uh, in the target scenario. And each one of the target is characterized by these three unknown parameters, uh, target reflectivity, alpha L, uh, which is uh, directly related with the size and shape uh, or radar cross section of the target. Um, we have range time delay or tau L, which is linearly proportional to the range of the target with respect to the radar. Doppler frequency omega L, which is linearly proportional to the radial or Doppler velocity of the target with respect to the radar. So the received signal is a superposition of uh, the echoes from all uh, these L targets. So we have summation over L and then we had P pulses, so summation over P. And the received signal is essentially the transmit signal itself, except that it has been delayed uh, with, uh, by tau L. So for each target, there's a delay. It has been scaled by alpha L, which is which was the target reflectivity, and it has been modulated by omega L, which is the Doppler frequency. The goal of sig radar signal processing is how we can get uh, these three parameters for all L targets using P pulses from this uh, received signal XT. Uh, we uh, assume some of the conditions here, uh, and these conditions are same as in Nyquist radars or the conventional radars. Uh, and what these conditions uh, tell us uh, is that uh, uh, all these unknown parameters, they don't change within the observation interval. So observation interval here is uh, P pulses. And uh, in uh, radar signal processing, we call it coherent processing interval or CPI. So within the CPI, uh, the reflectivity does not change, Doppler frequency does not change, and uh, uh, the range of the target uh, doesn't change. Because if it is changing, then we cannot estimate those things. So for 
for this observation interval, we assume that the channel, radar channel or the target parameters, they are constant. Of course, target is moving, but then uh, uh, we assume that it is slow enough or uh, the, uh, there is no acceleration or uh, the targets are far enough so that within that observation interval, everything is constant, allowing us to estimate these parameters. And these are not new assumptions for uh, uh, our work. Uh, these are the assumptions that are present in conventional radar signal processing as well. So just a primer uh, uh, to illustrate the differences between these reduced rate radars and uh, uh, the classical Doppler radar. Uh, uh, here is a block diagram that many of you might have seen, uh, especially those who work in radar signal processing. So typically the processing chain, the way it works is that uh, uh, we, we receive this signal and if its bandwidth uh, uh, is large, then we will be sampling it uh, at, a, at an IQ rate, which may also be large. And after that, the range information is obtained uh, uh, using pulse matched filters. So we do matched filtering uh, and then uh, we get the range. Uh, then we get the Doppler via FFT and sometimes these blocks could be exchanged also in um, uh, certain cases. And then once we have uh, uh, localized the uh, uh, this uh, processing in uh, delay and Doppler domain after these two blocks, then we get this delay Doppler map, something like this, where then we do a peak detection and then we localize uh, the targets uh, uh, in the delay and Doppler range. And there could be a lot of additional steps uh, uh, in this highly simplified uh, block diagram of radar signal processing. There could be super resolution and there are so many different types of algorithms uh, to just do this peak detection, for example. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, if we want high range resolution, we need large signal bandwidth, that means high sampling rate. So this connection between range resolution and sampling rate uh, is the cause of the problem uh, that uh, we cannot uh, uh, reduce the number of samples. So if we could change this processing, uh, then we may be able to break uh, the link between the bandwidth and the sampling rate and range resolution. And how do we do that? So uh, in the temporally reduced rate uh, radar, um, uh, here uh, uh, it is based on these concepts. So first we model the analog input uh, using small number of unknown parameters that is called finite rate of innovation theory or FRI theory, which was proposed by Martin Bitterly and others in 2002. Uh, so if you recall our received signal, which looked uh, like this, uh, L targets, P pulses, and then uh, uh, all those unknown parameters were encapsulated in this equation. So we can model the received uh, analog signal by just fewer par parameters. So essentially three L parameters. There were L targets and each target is characterized by three unknowns. So there are three L parameters. So what the FRI theory says that if you can parameterize your analog input with just few parameters, then, uh, uh, and this few parameters because the signal is sparse. That means there are just fewer targets in the scenario, which is usually the case in many radar applications. For example, if we consider uh, air traffic control radar at the airport, uh, which is scanning the sky, and then uh, there are fewer planes because if there were planes in every range wind, you don't need a radar, you can actually see uh, aircraft all over the sky, but that is never the case. There are fewer aircraft, and uh, uh, that's why the scenario is actually sparse. So if we have such a case, if we have such a sparse signal that can be parameterized by just a fewer a number of unknown parameters, then we don't need the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem to dictate how many samples uh, you should take in order to recover that signal. All you need is it is actually the number of samples that you need to recover such a signal are related to the number of unknowns uh, in that uh, uh, analog input. So if I had L unknowns uh, here in this uh, signal, then I actually need just more than two L uh, samples in frequency. That This is what FRI theory says. So it's not related to the bandwidth anymore. It is related to the number of targets now. So if you have L targets, uh, you will need number of samples which are uh, directly related to the number of those targets, not the uh, signal bandwidth, which is what Michael Shannon sampling theorem says. So this is what we call is breaking the link between the sampling rate and the uh, bandwidth. 
So we model our signal like this. Uh, so uh, uh, interestingly, the radar receives signal is actually already in that form. You don't have to separately model it. This is how usually the radar receives signal looks like. And then uh, after that, using a technique which is called complex sampling, uh, uh, we, which allows for this low rate sampling. So how to uh, which which uh, k Fourier coefficients we should choose. Uh, there are many ways on how to do that. So in exampling, that allows you to choose uh, 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 these k coefficients using one of the many techniques available in the literature, uh, which I'm not going into detail, but you can look into this uh, chapter I have in this book that I've given a reference here, uh, which, which goes into the details of those techniques. So uh, it allows us to get these low rate samples. Uh, afterward, uh, uh, we uh, do the, uh, this process called Doppler focusing, which is beam forming these low rate samples in the spectral domain. Uh, and then this gives us the Doppler information. Then we are left with uh, just the range and the reflectivity information, which we then solve using compressed sensing algorithm. Uh, and we don't lose range resolution in this case because uh, uh, this FRI enabled us to sample the signal uh, uh, without uh, uh, requiring the Nyquist rate. So if the target scenario is sparse, then you can uh, do signal recovery using complex sensing algorithms, L1 minimization, OMP. There, there's many algorithms for different cases. So this kind of theory has been backed up by very strong theoretical guarantees. So I just mentioned that uh, the number of samples is not related to the bandwidth, but rather to the number of targets. And this theorem actually uh, by Barilan and Eldar actually uh, states uh, that result. So if we go into uh, more details of each one of these blocks, uh, uh, then uh, the way this works is uh, we had the received signal. So for each pulse P, uh, we, we uh, call the received signal as a frame. So we separate the signal into frame. And then for each frame, we express it in terms of uh, its Fourier series representation. So if you derive the Fourier series representation of each, uh, uh, this received signal at each pulse or XPP uh, and write down the Fourier series coefficient, uh, then uh, the expression of the Fourier series coefficient encapsulates all the unknown uh, parameters. So you can see there's alpha L, omega L and tau L in the expression. And then we have this H, which is the uh, CTFT or continuous time Fourier transform of the transmit pulse, which we know, the transmit pulse waveform is known in case of radar. So uh, the goal is that we will get some of these coefficients, CTK. So the K is determined by FRI theory. Uh, and then if we can recover uh, uh, CPKs, then uh, we can get these unknowns as well, because they are all inside CTK. And then how many CPK to get? Uh, so uh, that is from FRI theory, like two L Fourier coefficients if you have L unknowns. So once we obtain this using exampling, uh, then we beam uh, this low, do the low rate beam forming. And how it is done, uh, we have the signal in Doppler delay domain. We discretize the Doppler uh, domain. And then we start the, this beam forming at, at each one of the points. So if there is a target at a particular Doppler velocity, you get a peak, otherwise it is a noise. So uh, uh, it be it be uh, beam form uh, uh, at the location of the target or new, so you will get a peak there. So what this does, uh, uh, this Doppler focusing does is, so we had this unknown delay Doppler problem. There were two unknowns. It was a two D uh, problem. Now it is uh, translated into after Doppler focusing, it is translated into a one D or only delays are unknown afterward. So, and, and this Doppler focusing can be done very efficiently, uh, for example, using FFT. And if you, we transmitted P pulses, it also enhances the SNR by P. So there are a lot of uh, 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 nice things about this uh, particular concept. So here uh, is the equation on how we do that. So uh, once you uh, beam form uh, uh, in the direction of new L, which is the velocity of the target, uh, then you get a peak because uh, we can approximate uh, after beam forming, we can approximate this summation by P. And if uh, uh, there was uh, was no uh, uh, target uh, present at that location, then you will just get noise. Uh, so uh, this equation just uh, says what, what I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, 
Uh, and then there are a lot of other ways on how to improve this. Uh, so you can do windowing and you can mitigate the impact of out of focus targets and so on. So uh, 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 th there are a lot of additional steps that go into this Doppler focusing uh, uh, aspect. Uh, but then the end result is that we have estimated the Doppler and now all that remains is the estimation of delays. So how do we do that? So for each Doppler frequency, uh, we uh, get these uh, the equivalent of CPK, and then we uh, collect uh, all those coefficients together uh, uh, to form this equation, an equation like this. So the psi v are all those focused coefficients where there was uh, Doppler. And then uh, when we look into the equation, then we have H, which is a diagonal matrix, uh, and that is related to the transmit waveform. We have V matrix, which is a partial DFT matrix. So if this was a Nyquist case, then V will be the full DFT matrix. But because <clears> we sample just K Fourier coefficients uh, uh, from the DFT matrix, so these are just uh, those K rows from the DFT matrix. It's not the full DFT matrix. And then we have this sparse vector, which is L sparse because there were L number of targets. So everything else is zero and wherever at the index uh, uh, of that vector, which is directly related to the location of the target, you have alphas. So the goal is to solve this uh, uh, equation. Uh, but then because V is partial DFT, we have uh, 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 more unknowns than the number of equations. So in general, we cannot solve this. There will be infinite number of solutions, but because XV is sparse, compressed sensing algorithms, they allow us to recover XV perfectly from uh, fewer measurements, which is psi V. Uh, and uh, the algorithms, like I mentioned, there is orthogonal matched pursuit, L1 minimization, several algorithms are available. So this is how we got the Doppler and then uh, we can also get uh, the range as well as reflectivities of the uh, targets uh, using this reduced rate, temporarily reduced rate radars. So this concept uh, was about how you can sample less uh, and still not lose range resolution uh, and recover uh, all the information uh, from the signal. Now let's look at the concept in the spatial domain. So uh, in the spatial domain, we are talking about, can we reduce the number of antennas? So uh, one way is that uh, you have the spaced array uh, and you could just uh, randomly remove some of the elements from the spaced array uh, and then apply similar concepts uh, in the spatial domain. So there has been work on random arrays since 1960s. Whitey Low uh, wrote uh, several papers on that. But at that time, there was no compressed sensing theory. So uh, uh, whenever you remove number of elements from a phase array randomly, then the side lobes, they rise and it becomes very difficult to estimate direction of arrival. Uh, so even though the concept dates back to 1960s, it was uh, it did not become very popular because of the side lobe problem. But when compressed sensing was proposed, then we had algorithms on how to actually recover DOA from random arrays. So same concept could be uh, extended uh, in this case. You remove randomly some elements and then you can recover it. But now we uh, extend this uh, uh, to another domain. We extend this uh, here to the MIMO domain. So in the MIMO radar, you have two uh, uh, arrays, one for transmit, another one for receive. Uh, so the tr uh, transmit uh, uh, array um, uh, or, or the receive array, one of those arrays will have the spacing lambda over two, which is the Nyquist spacing in ULA. And the other array will also be uniformly placed, but uh, will have uh, uh, lambda over two multiplied by the number of elements uh, in its uh, complementary array. So in this case, uh, my receive array has three elements uh, and they are uh, spaced lambda over two. Transmit array has, has these five elements, which are spaced by lambda over two multiplied by number of uh, antennas in the receive array that is three, uh, but they're all uniformly spaced. Even in this case, they're all uniformly spaced. And MIMO radar, uh, the way it works is that, uh, uh, unlike a phase array radar where they transmit uh, identical waveforms uh, and then uh, 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 form this coherent beam to track the targets, in MIMO, the transmit elements, they send out uh, separate waveforms, which are mutually orthogonal to each other, but then the coherent processing of all channels at the 
uh, receiver ensures that despite using fewer number of elements than a phased array, uh, you get the same angular resolution. So as you can see here, for within the same aperture, the Z is equal to TR lambda over two, the, the same aperture, if I use a phased array, I'm using probably like 20 elements here. But then uh, uh, in MIMO radar using fewer elements, I still get the same uh, resolution. It comes at a cost that you have to design mutually orthogonal waveforms. And then um, uh, at the receiver, uh, there, there may be additional digital uh, processing required, but then the hardware cost is significantly reduced. And uh, uh, MIMO comes in various uh, 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 forms. So the, the two broad categories are one is co-located MIMO radar where the target is so far from uh, the antennas that it appears identical to uh, the radar cross-section appears identical to all the array elements. And then we have the distributed MIMO radar where uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, radar cross-section uh, doesn't appear same to all the array elements because the array the transmit and receive, they are positioned far from each other. So we'll look into uh, an application of the distributed MIMO in this reduced rate concept uh, uh, toward the end of this presentation. So uh, here we are using a lot of elements in phased array, uh, all uniformly spaced. You can use random array, uh, as I mentioned, and combine it with compressed sensing algorithms, but how to do it for MIMO? So uh, uh, again, the same uh, concept applies to both of them. You, you want high DOA resolution, you need a large aperture, large number of elements, and then you want to break the link between the number of array elements and angular resolution. Uh, so the way we do it is, again, we apply this exampling concept here so that uh, the uh, resolution, the recovery of the DOA is not related to the number of elements, but rather related to the number of targets in the scenario. And that's how we can break this concept. Uh, so uh, in some of the uh, works, uh, uh, people have applied this in both domains. That means uh, first uh, you thin the MIMO array. So you randomly remove elements from both transmit array and receiver array. So already MIMO uses fewer number of elements than phased array. But if you apply this uh, compressed sensing based concept, uh, then you can reduce the number of elements in each one of those arrays as well. So it's even fewer than the conventional MIMO array. And then at each receive uh, uh, element, you apply this temporal reduced rate concept that I explained uh, 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 earlier. That means we take fewer number of elements and then we do the Fourier series representation uh, and then using FRI theory at each receive antenna, despite sampling, uh, uh, despite obtaining fewer samples, we are able to uh, uh, recover the signal without losing the range resolution. So this is what is called as a, a, a sub Nyquist MIMO in both spatial as well as temporal domain. And here are some of the details. So again, if we look at the received signal, now we have an additional summation, which is number of uh, uh, transmit uh, antennas. So uh, this M uh, summation is about that. And then if you look into the received signal, uh, so it's, it's scaled, delayed, and then modulated by Doppler. But then we also have this another exponential, which is about the DOA. So you get this additional exponential. Now we have to estimate all four parameters per target, alpha L, tau L, theta L, as well as uh, the, the Doppler shift. Uh, and we proceed in a very similar way. Uh, we look at uh, each frame, we uh, represent, uh, uh, we find out its uh, uh, Fourier uh, series rep uh, representation, and it turns out Fourier coefficients, they have all the unknowns. If you can recover those Fourier coefficients with sufficient number of samples as dictated by FRI, then you can get these unknowns as well. Uh, and when you look at the final equation that we have to solve, the compressed sensing equation. So if you recall in the temporal case, we had uh, uh, that psi V is equal to H V X V. So we, we had to recover a sparse vector in that case. But here now the uh, we have to recover a sparse matrix, which is this uh, uppercase X. And sparse matrix, it looks like this. So it is zero mostly, but wherever there is a target, so the column, uh, and the row indices, they indicate uh, the location in range and azimuth domain. So wherever there is a target, you have the reflectivity alpha one. So we want to solve this optimization problem. And then from the samples YM, that is M for each antenna, we want to recover X. 
And uh, the way to solve this is to uh, solve compressed sensing in the 3D domain. Uh, so there are versions of orthogonal matched pursuit algorithm that I had mentioned earlier for the 1D case. You can do this in the uh, sparse 3D recovery as well. So we looked into temporal domain, we looked into uh, uh, spatial domain, and now let's look into the Doppler domain. So uh, uh, Doppler domain uh, reduced rate means that I want to transmit fewer pulses and still keep the same resolution uh, in Doppler, Doppler resolution. So same concept applies there. You transmit, you randomly remove some of the pulses in the uniform pulse repetition uh, 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 time. Uh, so we were transmitting 10 pulses before, now I'll transmit uh, four pulses, but then I'll randomly choose them within that time. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, there is literature where they say that you still transmit 10, but you can transmit in two different directions. So blue can go uh, in one direction and then whatever time is left uh, in between, uh, you can actually send another direction using an array radar. Uh, there are those works as well. But here we are looking into just reducing the number of pulses in, a, in one particular direction. And if you reduce the number of pulses in one particular direction, also reduce the number of antennas and also reduce the number of uh, uh, these temporal samples at each antenna, then you get uh, this uh, tensor recovery problem uh, in radar, tensor reduced rate radar. So 1D vector was the case when we just temporarily reduce samples. You had to uh, recover a sparse matrix when we reduce samples both temporarily as well as reduce the number of antenna elements. And if we do both of those things, but additionally also reduce the number of pulses, then you have to actually recover a sparse tensor. So, uh, but rest of the process is similar. You do the Fourier series representation and so on, and then employ what we call as tensor OMP algorithm to actually recover a sparse tensor in all these three do domains simultaneously. So that uh, uh, with this kind of background that you can reduce number of samples in all of these domains, that brings us to this new work that we have been doing, which is about co-pulsing radar. So what is this co-pulsing radar? Uh, we are reducing uh, uh, here number of samples in all uh, 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 in the antenna domain, that is the number of elements, and as well as in the pulse domain. But there, there's an additional aspect here. So uh, uh, if you recall, I mentioned that there are various ways on how we can obtain these low rate samples uh, in literature. So one way is you just randomly sample uh, uh, and take fewer number of samples than the uh, regular Nyquist case. Another way that, is, that was proposed is what we call as co-prime sampling. In co-prime sampling, uh, if I'm doing it in the array domain, so I'll, um, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll have what we call as co-prime array. So we choose two co-prime numbers, which are relatively co-prime to each other. So for example, three and five are co-prime to each other. And then we form this array using this co-prime concept. Uh, uh, what it does is that uh, it actually, once, once you have that array, it is equivalent to the full array once you do the virtual array reconstruction using the co-prime array. So there is a long history of these arrays in what we call as minimum redundancy arrays that can we have uh, even fewer number of samples, but uh, without using compressed sensing, can we recover the direction of arrival? So you will find a lot of works on this without resorting to random array, because if you do random array, then the side lobe levels rise. So can we have fewer number of samples than a ULA or a uniform linear array? But uh, the algorithm, we should not be resorting to compressed sensing or anything like that. So before compressed sensing even came into picture, uh, there used to be several such uh, sparse arrays in the literature. So MRA is one of them, and, and there are a host of uh, uh, those uh, arrays. But the problem with those arrays was that as the array size increases, it be becomes difficult to find uh, uh, MRA or minimum redundancy array. So only for a moderate size of the array, you can find uh, uh, a sparser version of it where you can recover the signal without resorting to compressed sensing. But when the array size is large, uh, then how do we do that? So co-prime arrays were suggested that uh, uh, which can be scaled to even higher dimensions 
uh, and then the recovery is we are exploiting the sparsity in the target scenario. So combination of co-prime and sparse reconstruction enabled us to bring down the number of elements in a ULA uh, and still recover the signal without bothering about uh, uh, these side loads uh, because we are exploiting some version of compressed sensing there. So those were the co-primaries. Now what we do here is um, if we want to do um, a reconstruction of both azimuth as well as elevation angle, then you need a 2D array. So uh, in literature, uh, there's a lot of work on what we call as L-shaped arrays. So you have an L-shaped array, and it is a 2D array, so you can recover both azimuth as well as elevation, that is 2D angles. Uh, what we do here is we suggest uh, using a co-prime array in both arms of this l shape. So for azimuth as well as elevation, we are using uh, a co-prime array uh, in our case. Further, each element is transmitting co-prime pulses. So uh, as we have seen that the uh, this randomness, you can do it in any domain. You can do it in spatial domain, temporal domain, or in uh, pulse domain. So same with co-prime. Uh, although co-prime, uh, uh, mm -hmm. its major application was in the array domain. For arrays, it was suggested. In this work, we decided to do it in the Doppler domain. So we transmit pulses in a co-prime fashion. Uh, so if you see this here, it is uniform pulsing in this figure A. And then in B, we are doing random transmission, but the sequence of transmission and when exactly which pulse to transmit is, is dictated by this uh, co-prime theory. So we get uh, this problem where we have co-prime arrays in both arms of L, uh, L-shaped array. And we each element is also transmitting co-prime pulses. So even though fewer pulses, but then there's a specific structure there. And why are we doing that? Because we don't want to do uh, deal with these low side loops in the Doppler domain. Uh, and we also want something that could be scaled to a large number of arrays, a uh, large number of pulses. So those two concepts, and then we add a third concept on, on this, which is FDA, frequency diverse arrays, uh, which were first suggested in um, uh, antenna journals around 2004, 2005. Uh, and what, what it is about is that uh, uh, it says, uh, don't use the same frequency in a ULA. So uh, if you recall, when I mentioned MIMO, I said each transmitter is transmitting a mutually orthogonal waveform. So mutually, uh, mutual orthogonality could be in any domain. It could be in code domain, or you can do TDM uh, or DDM. And uh, a common version is FDM, that is frequency division uh, multiplexing you could do. So in that case, each transmitter is transmitting at a frequency uh, or a spectrum that doesn't overlap with the uh, spectrum of the other transmitter. So the result is you need a large bandwidth so that you can partition it among different uh, uh, transmitters. But in FDA, it says you can have some overlap. Uh, so it is somewhere between phased array and MIMO. Each transmitter is transmitting at a different frequency, but it is not completely orthogonal to the other transmitter. Uh, rather, the first transmitter transmits as frequency, let's say, Fc. The second transmitter transmits as Fc plus some offset. Uh, but the offset is not so huge that uh, the spectrum is non-overlapping. Spectrums are actually overlapping. Then the third transmits at uh, plus 2F0, uh, you know, twice the uh, offset and so on. And these offsets could be either linear or could be log. And then uh, in this case, it, you would have already guessed it could also be co-prime offsets. So now we have this co-prime thing in four domains. First is azimuth domain. The azimuth, the array is co-prime. Uh, elevation, that is another arm of L shape, that is also co-prime. Pulsing is co-prime. And because we, we are using FDA, uh, the offsets are also co-prime. So here is a table which actually explains uh, all these uh, va various uh, combinations, permutations and combinations. So of this first two were suggested in the literature, where the there are no frequency offsets because it is not an FDA. So ULA doesn't have frequency offset. Uh, it is only in this frequency diverse array. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain what is the advantage of using frequency diverse array. Uh, and here's the spectrum they use. 
uh, beam pattern is dependent only on angle. That is the classical uh, beam pattern. Uh, PRI is uniform, so no co-primeness. Co so the only thing is here uh, in this uh, particular reference, uh, the co-prime array was used, but the pulsing was still uniform. And then in our work, we explored all these other possibilities. That means you can have uh, frequency offsets, which could be linear or co-prime. Uh, PRI could be uniform and co-prime and so on. But uh, everything for FDA. So what happens in FDA? FDA produces a beam pattern that is dependent on both range as well as angle. It is a range dependent beam pattern. So ULA, you don't get that kind of beam pattern. It is uh, only angle dependent. The advantage of range dependent beam pattern is that in certain cases where um, uh, 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 you have to separately estimate the DOA and range, here because of this dependence uh, on both parameters, once you estimate one of the parameters, the second is uh, uh, ipso facto uh, estimated. It is automatically estimated. So you can do joint estimation of range and angle, and that is very efficient in certain cases. That is the advantage of FDA. It comes with the cost of uh, uh, requiring some additional spectrum. As you can see here, because we are putting offsets to different uh, antenna elements, you require slightly more uh, bandwidth than the regular ULA, but this bandwidth is much less than the FDM MIMO. So uh, as I said, uh, the advantage, it is somewhere in between MIMO and phased array and offers this range dependent beam pattern. So uh, uh, once we have something like this, uh, uh, a combination of various factors, like a 3D version of co-prime or 4D version, you can say azimuth elevation, we count them as separate domains. Uh, then in that case, again, we apply the entire theory I had explained earlier in separate domains, but here we apply them together. Uh, and then either using tensor processing or uh, uh, you can use this uh, uh, coupling uh, case like you, uh, recover range angle uh, uh, separately or jointly, uh, and then you uh, recover the Doppler part because of this co-prime pulsing uh, uh, in the second stage. So this is what we call as co-pulsing radar. And we have examined and uh, you know its performance uh, uh, in estimation of various parameters, angle, range, uh, Doppler, uh, and so on. And uh, we have shown that when all three, which we call a C cube, that is co-primeness in angle domain uh, uh, and the pulse domain and in the offset domain. So we, we are calling it C cube because it is in those three domains. So C cube uh, actually gives you advantages in terms of saving the bandwidth, saving the number of elements, saving the dwell time, while also providing uh, uh, one of the lowest uh, root mean square error in the uh, uh, parameter estimation. So this, is, this was the concept of co-pulsing radar. Now we look into a very interesting concept, which is related to this, which we are calling as COSTAP. That is how to do spa uh, space-time adaptive processing uh, using this kind of C-cube concept. So uh, if, if you um, uh, 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 recall some of the discussions uh, 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 that, that I mentioned earlier, um, I did not mention anything about clutter suppression. So uh, obviously in radar, we have noise, we have clutter, uh, clutter uh, present as well. So how we can uh, uh, employ uh, some of these concepts in the presence of clutter. Uh, so there are a lot of standard uh, uh, algorithms uh, compare sensing for clutter suppression, but here we are looking into an even more advanced version, which is space-time adaptive processing, which is traditionally used to mitigate clutter and jamming uh, for airborne uh, 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 radar arrays. Uh, and uh, uh, it has been around for many decades. Uh, there are a lot of uh, traditional staff applications. But the disadvantage is, is that, first of all, it is not applicable for very high speed platforms. I, I, in fact, I, I, when it is a high speed uh, platform uh, uh, or aircraft, then you need a high PRF. Uh, you need to transmit high PRF uh, so that Doppler ambiguity is resolved. But if you transmit high PRF, it leads to uh, range ambiguity problem because the range becomes a smaller. Uh, we are transmitting at a uh, high PRF. So the range uh, problem is there. Range ambiguity increases. And in that case, when the range ambiguity increases, then the clutter suppression becomes the problem. 
So typically, uh, the platforms are low speed while applying uh, traditional stack. Uh, you can alleviate this problem by using FDA stack. So in FDA, because of this range dependent beam pattern, it gives you an additional degree of freedom to suppress clutter. So uh, uh, because of, uh, so as I mentioned that range ambiguity is an issue if you want to fly the radar at a very high speed, uh, uh, because then to alleviate the Doppler ambiguity, you'll have to transmit at high PRFs. But if you use FDA array, then to some extent, uh, you can uh, resolve this range ambiguity because of uh, this additional domain, the range dependent beam pattern. But the problem here is that in normal FDA stack, we are still gathering samples uh, at an Nyquist rate. So the space samples, that means the array is Nyquist. Uh, uh, it's like an ULA, FDA, right? Uh, and then um, uh, the Doppler domain, we are transmitting at uniform PRT. So everything is Nyquist and the number of samples are uh, huge. Computational cost uh, increases in this case. So our goal is, can we use this co-pulsing concept that I mentioned where we transmit fewer pulses and in uh, uh, co-pulsing FDA, we have fewer frequency offsets. We use fewer number of elements. Can we apply this to STAP to actually uh, uh, mitigate clutter while also uh, avoiding computational costs and all these range and Doppler ambiguity problems? So uh, the way we proceed in this case is, so we use the C cube structure that I mentioned that is co-prime FDA, so fewer elements, co-prime frequency offsets, and co-prime PRT, so fewer pulses. The advantage of this is that you do not have this mutual coupling, the range Doppler coupling, uh, sorry, range angle coupling, because we have this joint uh, beam pattern. We have increased degrees of uh, freedom in the co-array domain, which allows us to uh, uh, deal with the, uh, this range ambiguity problem and then suppress clutter. And the aperture is also large. Uh, the virtual aperture is also large. So uh, all these advantages, they come with this co-pulsing concept. However, the problem becomes so complex that uh, we have to find some uh, uh, a better way to solve it. And we'll see uh, how, how we do that in a bit. So here's the signal model. Uh, we have these array element positions, which are determined by co-prime uh, uh, array and same with the frequency offset and the pulses. So all of them, they are determined using the uh, co-prime concept. Then uh, once you uh, form your received signal equation, uh, and uh, then you uh, uh, write the uh, 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 clutter plus noise uh, 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 received signal. So when there is no target, we have just clutter and noise. Uh, then in STAP, uh, one of the key steps is the construction of clutter covariance matrix. And normally you can just take this YL and then form its uh, uh, clutter covariance matrix like this. However, when we have the, this problem, that is we are doing co-pulsing and then FDA and all, all those other things that I mentioned, then in that case, uh, we do not have sufficient number of training samples. So your clutter covariance matrix is not properly estimated. Further, we have this range dependence because of FDA. So you have to use some additional technique, what we call a secondary range dependence compensation. And then you have to use some additional techniques to actually enhance the rank because you didn't get enough number of samples. So how, how can we enhance the rank of this clinical variance matrix? And then uh, in STAP, uh, as you can see here, the STAP, STAP requires construction of this filter, which can alleviate jamming as well as clutter. And when you get the filter, which is this W, then it has the inversion of R. So inverse of R is involved. And uh, when R becomes large, the dimension becomes large, then the inversion of R is very computationally expensive uh, step. So how can we deal with this uh, computationally expensive step now that we are doing this uh, uh, co-prime co in all these three domains, the dimensions are very large as well. And then we also have non-uniform sampling in this particular case, because we are not using normal FDA, normal ULA, we are using co-prime. So the sampling is also non-uniform in this case. The way we solve it is how to invert this R. We use a result from uh, a very classical results of sleepian functions or discrete prolate spheroidal sequences. 
So once you look into uh, the uh, this RV, the after, after spatial smoothing, so uh, as I mentioned, you have to enhance the rank. You can do that with spatial smoothing technique. So you, then you get an expression of R, this complicated expression like this. But then we want to invert R in order to find out those filters. And when you have non-uniform sampling and uh, uh, an expression like this, we can use uh, results from sleepian function or discrete prolate spheroidal sequences which allow us to approximate the, this inversion uh, very effectively. Uh, so this is uh, something we did in our recent work, uh, uh, and it's a very nice application of sleepian functions or DPSS uh, in this uh, radar and co-pulsing uh, application. So you can see the details in our paper, but then how effective it is, I present uh, two results in this case. So uh, here is an example where we have uh, uh, a number of ambiguities are about three, and then uh, in a physical domain with uh, uh, traditional STAP, uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, clutter spectrum that we get. So it is able to resolve, uh, in, when the ambiguities are fewer, traditional STAP is able to resolve uh, those ambiguities. And then uh, this is in a co-worry domain, how it looks like, and when we use DPSS to approximate this uh, uh, clutter spectrum, then uh, here also it is able to resolve uh, like uh, very nicely the uh, those ambiguities. So number of ambiguities less, physical uh, domain or the traditional stab gives the same results as the co-pulsing DPSS. But then when the no number of ambiguities increase, like here there are six, uh, you cannot, uh, uh, the traditional STAP is unable to accurately estimate it. In query domain, we see those ambiguities, but then um, uh, it is not, uh, uh, if, if I do the traditional inversion, then this is the result that I get. Uh, it has a lot of uh, background noise and uh, uh, you know strange kind of structures. But then if I use DPSS, I, uh, it is able to very accurately approximate uh, the uh, clutter spectrum and without all these other artifacts. So DPSS is very effective in uh, these kind of cases. So this was all about uh, uh, various aspects of this sparse reconstruction in radar. Obviously, there are this literature is huge, very difficult to summarize. So I will close this by. Uh, giving highlights of what else we, we have been doing and how these concepts could be extended to various other applications. So one of the other concepts is, so we started with the pulse Doppler radar, but if you want to extend this in the continuous wave uh, or CW kind of application, uh, then that is also possible. So for example, SFW radars or step frequency radars, uh, you can actually extend similar kind of concepts. Um, so traditionally, SFW radars, they, uh, they are used to yield high range resolution profiles, so they occupy very wide bandwidth, and uh, uh, they also suffer from this range Doppler coupling uh, problems, and uh, you, you can probably randomize the step frequencies, but, uh, and that will break the coupling, but then you end up using the whole bandwidth uh, in, any, uh, in that case as well. So we suggested um, uh, a particular case where you can you randomly step through the frequencies, you can also sparsely use it and address all these issues. So this table actually, and this figure explains what we are proposing and what is there in the literature. So SFW is this step frequency radar. We are, it occupies all the frequencies. You can randomize it, but you are still using all the frequencies. You can sparsify it, uh, and uh, 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 then you use fewer frequencies, but then the coupling problem is there. So we propose raster where you do both, sparsify uh, the number of frequencies that you're using, as well as randomize them. So you use fewer frequencies and you break the coupling. And uh, using this kind of concept and a combination of everything else that I've explained so far, you can derive uh, performance guarantees, and uh, a comparison with uh, traditional radars, uh, uh, it shows that uh, uh, this technique does work and we are able to resolve targets which are very closely spaced and in various other scenarios uh, to the advantage of this technique compared to traditional SFW radars. Uh, but this can also be extended to uh, cases where we do not have sparsity in the traditional domains. For example, in ground penetration radar, where uh, the signal is not sparse either in Doppler domain, spatial domain, or temporal domain. In that case, you can do what we call as construction of sparse dictionaries. Uh, you can 
actually find a basis, an arbitrary basis in which signal could be sparse, and then you can apply these sparse sampling concepts there. So this is the work we did with Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, which actually builds upon these concepts when the signal is not sparse in any one of the traditional domains. And then you do what we call as dictionary learning to find a dictionary or basis in which the signal could be sparse. Uh, I had mentioned earlier about co-located MIMO radar, and I had said there's another version which is called widely separated MIMO radar. So we have uh, recently extended this concept to widely separated case where we use a 2D compress sensing reconstruction, what we call as matrix completion algorithms uh, to uh, sample at a lower rate, but is still able to reconstruct uh, uh, the target scenario using this matrix completion techniques. And uh, finally, uh, we were looking only into active radars so far, not passive radars. Uh, so this is a recent work where we have extended um, uh, this uh, concept of uh, what we call as one-bit ADCs. So you only sample a one-bit, not full resolution. That is a, another version of compressed sensing. And we applied this to a case of passive distributed one-bit radar where we showed range recovery uh, using just one-bit samples. And then there uh, is a host of literature on one-bit sampling uh, where you can find uh, more information. So with this, I would like to close this talk. Uh, 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 so in this talk, we studied uh, this sparse reconstruction in various domains, primarily spatial, temporal, and Doppler, uh, and uh, across a variety of radar applications. Um, uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of the other works that I do is joint radar communications uh, on which uh, we have this uh, book coming out in a couple of months. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, please do check out this book and uh, a lot of tutorials also uh, I typically do on these topics, the ones that I mentioned today, as well as on joint radar communication. So you can find more information on my LinkedIn feed uh, about upcoming tutorials. So uh, uh, I hope to see you in one of those conferences as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mishra, for interesting, very interesting talk. Let me see if you have any questions um, from online or- Somebody raised his hand. Yes, somebody just raised his hand. If somebody wants to ask a question online. Can you? Yes, can you hear me well? Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Mishra, a fantastic survey of a very, very wide and deep field. Question for you on the case of the separated transmitters and receiving arrays. Is there a benefit that can be achieved if they can switch roles at any time? In other words, they can blink. Uh, the left side can become the, tr the receiver and the right side can become the transmitter. And then milliseconds later, the roles are reversed. Is that uh, is there any gain that can be achieved that way? So, um, I, I, I mean, I, I haven't heard of something like this, but I'm just uh, uh, trying to understand the question itself. So I guess you're talking about MIMO, right? Where we have a separate transmitter A and the receiver A. And, Correct. Um, yes. So yeah. uh, if, if we could do this, like what you said, like, uh, 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 you know, let's just uh, consider one case where I have a, uh, I have this particular case that I had mentioned in my uh, talk. I mean, I, I would uh, actually focus on what will be the restriction there. If we could resolve it, then yes, uh, there are advantages there. So, for example, let's let's look into this case. Yes. Here I have this transmit, which is uh, uh, sorry, receive, which is spaced by lambda over two, and then. Transmit has to be spaced by lambda over two R, right? If uh, there, there of course can be a case where you space transmit by lambda over two, and then the receive is by lambda over two multiplied by T, okay? So uh, uh, yes, I mean, you can do beam forming at uh, uh, receive as well, uh, if, if you could switch that. But then this uh, number of uh, antennas and spacing, that issue should also be resolved. Uh, maybe my example is more further is correct 
correctly displayed by the picture just to the right of the enclosed oval, where you have separate receivers and transmitters separated by large distances. If those receivers and transmitters swap on an, on an irregular or prime basis or wh whatever time basis you wish, would there be benefit? Uh, the benefit will be that uh, uh, to exploit the spatial diversity. So when these are the uh, receivers here, they are looking at the cross section from this direction, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, and that gives it uh, one uh, aspect perspective of the radar cross section. Now, right. if you switch the roles, then the radar cross section will be different for this group of receivers, right? The, which were correct. Receivers. So, yes. Uh, you can exploit that spatial diversity in finding a, a more uh, reconstructing a more accurate target information. So yes, uh, you could actually exploit the spatial diversity in that case. Interesting. Thank you. That was my question. Great. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions from online? Anybody? Any question here? Go ahead, Shahid. Question is in the recovery mode. When you're using the compressed sensor, does the system need to be updated, calibrated, or anything like that with errors? Okay, I, I didn't get the full question. Maybe you want to get closer to the to the um, mic. Yeah. When you're doing your recovery model, the system using compressed sensing and uh, does it need to be uh, updated or calibrated or controlled in some way or contained? That is irrelevant. So the question is, when we are doing recovery uh, with compressed sensing, uh, does the radar needs to be updated and calibrated? Right. Yes, of course. Uh, I, I mean, uh, for example, let's take the case of weather radar, where the calibration is of fundamental importance uh, 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 for those kind of uh, systems. Uh, and yes, calibration is needed in order uh, to actually, you know, accurately uh, get, let's say, the reflectivity or the power information. Everything else comes afterwards. So one thing that we must remember uh, in um, uh, these uh, reduced rate radars is everything that you could do or you are doing in the Nyquist case, many of those things apply here as well. It's just uh, when you start sampling low, uh, at a lower rate, then how to do the rest of the processing. That doesn't mean we don't have to calibrate the radar. You still have to calibrate the radar because so that you can get accurate power information uh, and then the entire hardware is also, uh, you know, it's a, uh, sanity is, uh, sanctity is uh, restored, so to say. It doesn't malfunction uh, because all of this processing is in the digital domain. You still have to do RF calibration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's in some of these, uh... Slides you mentioned that one of the assumptions is that there's no noise or noise less fitting. I'm wondering how this theory will be extended to the case where we do consider noise. How does this impact? No, so we do consider noise. I, I uh, uh, so I, I had mentioned here uh, in this case. So I'd mentioned here that if in the Absence of noise, everything else is zero, and we have just non-zero increase. In the presence of noise, everything else is noise, and there are a few significant increase. So you modify your optimization problem by adding a regularization term that directly depends on the variance of the noise, and then you solve this problem. So yeah, you can easily uh, introduce noise uh, in this. So uh, in fact, uh, uh, it'd be looking to the co-pulsing plot uh, yeah. Yeah. This co-pulsing plot. So, I'm I'm plotting it with respect to SNR here. So there there is noise uh, mm -hmm. in this case. Yeah. Okay. And then yeah, on this slide, I was wondering, can you explain why there's sort of a sharp increase in the error when you drop below a certain signal to noise ratio? Oh yeah. There's 
So, uh, well, I mean, if uh, we look into, so this this line, dotted line, uh, dashed line here is the Kramer Rao lower bound. And uh, we know that Kramer Rao lower bound is a, a accurate uh, uh, or a reasonable uh, indicator of uh, 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 mean square error only at pi SNR. As the SNR goes down, uh, in that case, uh, we enter into the ambiguity region, uh, and then it is no longer a very good indicator of, uh, of that. And the uh, error, of course, at lower SNR, SNRs, the estimation errors also rise, but uh, even the uh, CRLB is not a very good indicator uh, of the lower errors in the, uh, of the mean square error in that. I mean, at, at some, as you are in decrease, as you're, you decrease uh, SNR, at some point of time, it will break down completely uh, the estimation process and suddenly the error will rise. I mean, it won't be like a linear decrease in uh, RMSE. At some point of uh, this very low SNR, you will see that it breaks down completely. Any, any other questions? I think Daniel ah. raised his hand. Yeah. Yes. Uh, for more, I, I have a I have a related question. Uh, the description of noise that you gave uh, seems to me it's uh, relevant to the white noise. Uh, what if if we have a correlated noise or a colored noise that would affect the number of samples within the correlation time of the of the noise itself? So each correlation time. The number of samples in that time is would see a different signal or different noise property than the next correlation time. How do you can you take can you take that dose into account or there yes. is no uh, yes so, uh, yes yes uh, so that's a great question uh, indeed because uh, so as I as I mentioned everything that we do in the Nyquist case you have to do those things here as well. So in the Nyquist case, if we have colored noise, we do whitening, right? We apply the whitening step and mm -hmm. then we proceed with the rest of the thing. So here, before you apply all these uh, compression zinc and all, all these other steps, before that you apply whitening here as well. Uh, you whiten your colored noise and then pro proceed with uh, focusing, Doppler focusing, compression zinc, all those steps. And th there are a lot of works on this uh, topic as well. Is there a... Is there a technique that you receive uh, X number of samples just for the purpose of determining its uh, spectral properties or correlation time so that you know what is coming at you in terms of noise and then you can take into account that those statistical properties of the signal into your subsequent measurements. Is there a procedure related to that? So by statistical properties, you mean, can we uh, do some kind of uh, statistical estimation? Yeah. The spectrum? Correlation, yeah, spectral properties or correlation properties. Uh, one is fully transferred with the other. Uh, yeah, so for example, I mean, uh, when we are doing this noise regularization term, all we are interested is in the variance, right? So we do variance yeah. estimation. Now in uh, copulsing step, as I mentioned, uh, our goal is to accurately estimate the clutter spectrum. And uh, uh, one of the techniques that I mentioned was this using DPSS to approximate the clutter spectrum and it does a very good job at it. So uh, my, my answer to that question will be, yes, there are techniques, but those are not very different than what we already do in conventional cases. You do all those things. Uh, and then after that, uh, this particular processing follows. So if, if you have colored noise, you do whitening here as well. And then after that, you apply this particular technique. If you want to do estimation of statistical properties, here it is not very different. You you use similar processes and then you apply the rest of the technique. Yes, with the reduced number of samples, how do you do that? So there is a literature on that. Like DPSS allows you to approximate the clutter spectrum when the samples are non-uniformly sampled, right? So yes, there, there are techniques uh, on, on these aspects. Oh, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Daniel has a question. Oops, go ahead. Okay. Yes, Dr. Dr. Mishra, question for you on a maneuvering target. 
the way I understand what you presented is that we take multiple multiple pulses and in, in a way stack them together inside of a matrix. And that assumption is that the target reflectivity and or speeds are not changing. Am I correct or incorrect on that? Uh, that is right. Yes. Uh, in in that observation interval, they are not changing. They will change in the next CPI, but within the CPI, yes. uh, they are constant. Yeah. Now, but if it's a maneuvering target, uh, uh, an evading target, in other words, a target that, that understands that you're trying to find it, what happens in that situation? Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, again, I'll, I'll go back to the same thing. Suppose we have that situation in a Nyquist radar. Uh, yes. then what do we do? I mean, you you can start sampling faster because the target yes. is moving so fast. But then when you're trying, because first you still have to estimate where the target is. And then Correct. The step, when it changes, then you do the estimation again. But then you're going to hit the target with pulses more frequently, right? With, uh, which is what I mentioned that uh, uh, you will have to use high PRF in that case, but then there will be issues with the range ambiguity. But all of those things are there in the conventional radars too. You, you do all those things here also. You start hitting it very frequently because see, we are not considered with, uh, uh, like this whole world doesn't say you have to design a new system. It's only about you sample less and then you recover everything, right? So you, you do exactly the same thing what you were doing in Nyquist case. That means uh, in that case, you will start uh, transmitting more frequently, but then when you do the coherent processing in a CPI, even for a maneuvering target, you'll be assuming that within those number of pulses, when you're trying to estimate its current position, its current uh, Doppler velocity, those parameters are constant within that. Because uh, otherwise, you can't estimate it, right? Except that now your duration of CPI will become, uh, you know, uh, somewhat smaller. Hmm. So there's a there's I guess there's a quality the co-pulsing radar has some figure of merit of of um, what it thinks the quality of its target is and would go back to a Nyquist uh, mode of operation if that figure of merit is too low. Is that the right logic? Uh, you could do that. I mean, we, we don't do this in, in this particular world, but yes, I mean, you keep on transmitting uh, at a regular case because uh, th there is some additional digital processing involved in co-pulsing radar. So if you don't want to do that additional processing or you want to imply that processing only when uh, there is a an opportunity or need, uh, then you keep both processing in your system. You do the all, all you always transmit in the Nyquist case, but then uh, when when you think that, uh, 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 like you said, if there is a target that is changing very frequently, right, uh, uh, yes. a lot in that case, uh, or the target environment is very dynamic, that you may need to look into two different directions. Then in that case, you transmit co-prime and whatever gaps that are there, that could be used for some other purposes. Exactly. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Okay, uh, I guess that's all for the questions. If there's no more, let's thank our speaker one more time. And... Yeah, thank you. Very interesting topic and uh, looking forward to uh, the next meeting. Um, I guess we're going to close the tonight's session and say good night to everybody, including Dr. Mishra, who in the East Coast is now 11.30. Yes. Yeah, good night. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll appreciate if you guys can send me some photographs of the event uh, because uh, I think AESS likes to uh, uh, you know feature them. Right. On social media. I don't think if we took any picture photographs, we did record the session and it will be posted. Yeah. Oh, I, I spoke too soon. <laughs> yeah, you can take a photograph now, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Yeah, bye.